Welcome, everyone, to another episode of What's Working Special Edition. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regions, the special edition show we set up a while back to focus on the impact of COVID. And goodness knows there have been quite a few things that have happened since the inauguration of this show back in mid-March. COVID seems like it's fading from our memory right now, though it's still very relevant. It's not what we're talking about as much as we used to. And one wonders how much a role COVID is going to play in the headlines going forward. Though it's very relevant, it's somehow fallen to the second or third tier of the uh, news cycle these days. It's crazy what's going on out there. We're going to talk about what's going on out there. But before we do that, I want to tell you about tomorrow night's show. This is the Wednesday 6 p.m., what we call the original edition of What's Working with Cam Marston, where we dig deep into a business. And we're always looking for ones that have a good story to tell. And tomorrow night, we're featuring Shelly Waggispack. Shelly is the owner and president of of Pat O'Brien's Bar in New Orleans. I thought, let's go find some place that so many of us can relate to. Let's go find a place that we all have had fun in, that we can kind of make a, a smile will form on our face as we think of this place. And I immediately thought of Pat O'Brien's. I'm dying to get back to New Orleans. I hadn't had my New Orleans fix in a while. And we got Shelly on the line to tell us of what's going on with Pat O'Brien's. They've gone from 150 people on the payroll to 50 which shocked me that there are still 50 people on the payroll in a city where so much has been shut down. In the meantime, they've been uh, power washing the bar. And if you've been in there, you think, yeah, it could use a good power washing. That's probably well overdue. I think they found seven or eight corpses in the process. That's not true. That's not true. But Pat O'Brien's, and if you're looking for a special deal, if you have a plan of going to uh, Pat O'Brien's, Shelley's offered a special deal, a free drink. And in order to get that, text what's working to 44222, and you'll get the details on how to get that drink. Again, what's working to 44222. It's the same text offer, the text line that we've had uh, set up recently. Now, today's show. When I tell you you're about to meet a demographer when we come back from the break, Uh, You may say, well, what's that all about? These people study the population. They study the movements of the population. Demographics is our future. It's irreversible. And I am bringing to you the world's greatest demographer from my point of view. Gerald Beerling has been a very important part of my work for at least the past 10 years. And when I go visit my clients and have to prepare with the demographics of their marketplace, Gerald is not only the first, he's the only one I call. What Gerald has showed me, as he and I have been keeping up through the COVID crisis, is that there is a disproportionate impact of the COVID crisis on the youth of our society. They have been hit by the crisis, not physical ailments, but economic ailments in a disproportionate way. We're going to talk about what those effects have been and what we might can expect from them out of this. Now, a tangent of this that we could go on forever, and this station is not afraid of a political conversation, is that 25 million members of Gen Z, the youngest population out there, 25 million members will be eligible to vote for the first time in November. They've seen COVID. They've seen riots. They're living through a recession. How is this going to shape them? We'll come back from that uh, conversation with Gerald, and I'll have Michael Silver on the line. I spoke to him the other day, and my goodness, there's no one that more embodies the uh, ability to pivot than Michael Silver, uh, Silver. And we'll finish up with Carly Waters. I asked her this very simple question. Why did chips say so, taste so good when I'm stressed? She's a fitness expert. And find us on social media. Get ready for what's going to be an interesting conversation today. We'll begin with Gerald when we get back from this break. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regions. You're listening to What's Working, brought to you by Regions. I'm Cam Marston, and on the line with me is a great aide, perhaps, and I've teased with him about this in the past, that a life insurance policy on him would be something I should invest in due to the value of his research to me. Gerald Beerling. Gerald teaches statistics. 
and research methods in the sociology department at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, yet another Canadian. He specializes in demographic research and surveys, and he helps me interpret the data that he sends me on a regular basis, even sends it to me in my own slide format. So all I have to do is drop it into my presentation. Gerald, it's a delight to speak to you again. Welcome to What's Working. Thank you very much, Cam. I'm glad to have you. It's glad to, uh, good to make contact with you and hear your insights on the demographic shifts that you've seen as a result of the COVID economy. I said in the opening comments that the youth in our society have taken it on the chin more so than any other age group. Tell me why that is. Yeah, so the youth have really taken it on the chin essentially because they work in what are called uh, high-risk industries, or they, they tend to be overrepresented in high-risk industries. So, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, is new. Researchers have been looking at this for a while now, including the Bureau of Labor Statistics and organizations like Pew Research. And what they found is that youth are overrepresented in certain types of industries uh, that are especially vulnerable or hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. I read in some of the research that you had sent along that half of the oldest Gen Z, they define them, uh, this, these half of the oldest are between 18 to 23 years old, reported that they or someone in their household had lost a job or taken a cut in pay because of the outbreak. No other generation has seen such impact that they or someone in their household have been so adversely impacted. Not the millennials, not the Xers, not the baby boomers. Why them? Well, the, it has to do with the nature of the industries that they are more likely to be found in than other generations. So, you know, when we think about industries or sectors of the economy comprising different parts, you know, there's things like restaurants, hotels, child care services, and retail trade. These are the kinds of sectors of the economy where you find a disproportionate number of younger workers. And what's unique about these industries, or what makes them different than a lot of other industries, is that there's a lot of um, personal interaction between people, a lot of lack of physical distancing, if you will. And so, you know, with the COVID pandemic and all the lockdowns and shutdowns put in place because of the requirement for social distancing, who's going to be hit hardest? Well, the people in those types of jobs. And, you know, those are, a lot of them are younger people. Have historically we've seen, have we seen anything historically similar to this, that such a, a disproportionately small segment of society has been hit so disproportionately hard? And, and what was that time and how did they react? Well, I can't remember one or I, in my research, I haven't come across one this bad. Um, primarily because the economy has changed a lot in the last 20 to 30 to 40 years where, you know, we used to have economies based on manufacturing where people went to factories and plants and, and did things. Now we have a lot of service sector jobs, much more so than, you know, a generation or two ago. So we see more people employed in those sectors, and a lot of those people are younger people. So... You know, that's why we haven't seen anything quite like this, I don't think, before. Can you make a prediction, Gerald, on what the outcome of these young people may be? Let's look five years down the line. Are they going to be scarred? Are they going to be, uh, is this going to lead to a, a, a movement of voters in a way that we perhaps can or cannot predict? Well, I mean, this is a big question, right? Like, how long... Um Will this pandemic last, and will we need to shut down things again if we get a second wave in the fall or the winter? So, you know, depending on the severity and the length of all of this, which therefore will influence the amount of time that uh, these people are laid off or unemployed, that has actually long-term impacts on their career. So previous research has shown, like the last time that United States and Canada and North America went through a recession that young people who were entering the labor market at that point or who had just started their work careers were had this long lasting impact on the amount of money they earned and their careers later on in life so it's sort of a lasting impact and you know the term actually used in the research is you know this scarring effect which just doesn't leave 
And so their inability to earn later on is a result of the scarring, of, uh, to earn later on is a result of the scarring effect. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, or, you know, the scarring is the fact that, you know, they're just not earning as much as they would as if, if they had entered the labor market when the economy was booming or when the economy was doing well. And it's, so, you know, the scarring is the long-lasting impact. And it's, a re- it's not a result of attitude. It's not a result of a, um, you know, a, a, a developing a shell and I've been treated unfairly or, or this just happened to me and no one else can relate. It's just that they never got a toehold at the same age as other people on either side of them, as groups on either side of them did. Is that right? That's, that's exactly it. In fact, you know, some of the other research that I, I was looking at with you, indicated that younger people are actually fairly optimistic, almost to the point of, you know, being naive about, you know, what are the impacts on you uh, of this pandemic, where they seem to consider it to be less of a serious problem than, than older generations. So, you know, that kind of struck me as odd, because, you know, they're being disproportionately affected in a negative way, being unemployed and earning less now, but they're rating it as not quite a serious problem. Now, are they rating it not a quite a serious problem due to their, and I'm not, this is not the correct term, immunity to the disease or to uh, they just don't see their future as being impacted like you and I are discussing here? Yeah, I just think they don't see it as having a long-term impact on their on their future and on their careers and on their, you know, their ability to get married and have children, start families and own a house and all of that, you know. I keep thinking of the phrase, hope springs eternal. Well, it kind of always springs eternal amongst the youth, right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know whether that's because we come, become more jaded over time or when we weren't when we were young or what. I'm not quite sure. A psychologist would probably have more to say on that. It seems to me in some of the information that you've sent me that there has almost been a bifurcation of the youth in that some of them have invested more. Some of them have pulled money out of their savings as a result mm-hmm. of the crisis. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, and I think this speaks to, you know, maybe a lack of understanding amongst a a large portion of youth. I mean, I don't want to consider, you know, us old people to be all wise, but I think we uh, understand a little bit more about the vagaries of the market and the economy, and we tend to maybe have a a bit different or a long-term view of, of what we should do with our money. Uh, which is probably lacking a little bit amongst younger generations. Yeah. It's just that it's not that they don't want to understand. It's just, you know, maybe they don't understand and don't rate these things as seriously as we might. What about instances in the past, Gerald, where there have been a, uh, the population has been impacted? And we're speaking about the youth here. The youth population has been impacted. And they come back with the solution of more government. Because that's some of the research that Pew has revealed is that the youth today feel like the solution to nearly everything and even those who raise their hands as as describing themselves as republicans sense or say that more government is the solution do we see crisis that impact youth uh those youth come out to uh, be big advocates of greater government well i think all younger voters generally are if we compare younger voters to older voters younger voters are, are typically more more liberal or more in favor of active government than our older voters and younger people are are more liberal or or left-leaning and as you get older you become more conservative i mean the research shows that too right yeah so i think we've generally fit into that pattern as well or or we might be seeing the start of that as well which is brought on more so by the the covid19 pandemic so nothing unusual about their bias towards more government right now it would be unusual if in 25 or 30 years they still held that bias that that would be my take on it yeah that's right so if i'm a business owner right now gerald what are the what are the data points what are the demographic numbers that should be most important to me as i try to figure out where this is going for my own business well the demographic numbers are the employment numbers of course uh, which the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases on a regular, you know, monthly basis. Uh, some of your listeners probably know that there's some debate about the most recent numbers that were released at the end of last week and whether, how accurate they are. And so, you know, those numbers will probably be revised in light of the challenges of collecting accurate data in this time. 
Um, but definitely the unemployment numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, those are key. And also uh, any income data that uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics can will release. So those are the two numbers that are going to help me as a business owner figure out where this whole uh, COVID economy is going. Now, from your position, from your point of view, as a demographer who studies this content as well as who teaches it, what's the most interesting piece of data you're looking for or are watching that you feel like will tell the biggest story? Uh, that's the unemployment number. Yeah, I mean, the numbers, the numbers the last few months have just been so dramatic and have shown such a difference between younger workers and older workers. I mean, it's bad overall, but it's uh, incredibly different between younger people and older people. I mean, you're looking at, you know, 14, 15 percent unemployment and higher amongst workers under the age of 30 and uh, much lower amongst older workers. So, you know, that's a big thing. And so I would want to keep my eye on that trend for sure. Let's ask you to put on a different hat. I know you're a okay. parent. What do, you, what do these numbers say to you as a parent? If you have a child that's in this large unemployment sector, sector what does this say yep. to you as a parent or perhaps an employer as they're looking out and they need to rehire now? Should they favor the youth just due to the, the, uh, the overwhelming burden that may face the youth that say, if I'm going to hire somebody, I'm going to do these kids a favor because of what I've heard here today? Well, I would hope that, you know, uh, employers would have a soft spot for those who are particularly hard hit by this pandemic. Uh, whether that's the case or not, I don't know. I mean, the odd thing is, is that uh, education rates have risen dramatically over the last generation. So, you know, our younger people are better educated now, uh, but sometimes it's still hard for them to find employment. Would, so. yeah, I, 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 I think it's going to be hard for a while to come, is my impression. I have peers who have college kids, uh, some recently graduated from college, who can't find a summer job and yeah. are looking for a way to, uh, you know, to, to, to pay for their own weekend money or something like that. And it's and they're, they're struggling to find summer work out there. And there are consequences that come to people who continually try to find work and can't find it. It's a... Uh, I think there was a time in the past they called it the, the lost generation, and it was more uh -huh. recent than we – it was post-2008 when the Great Recession fell in, and the new graduates at that time couldn't find a job, and they have been in a quagmire ever since. Yeah, and so that's that sort of long-lasting impact that it has on a person's life. Um, you know, through no fault of their own, they you know, they were told to get a good education, and they went out and they – they got a good education, and then they are faced with a labor market that doesn't want or need them. So, yeah, it's really tough. And I think it might also have an impact on educational participation rates uh, over the next few years. I mean, this is something that I think post-secondary education institutions are going to know more about in a couple months' time. You know, how many students are they going to get in the fall? And where I work, too, at McMaster University in Hamilton, you know, we're not entirely sure. And there's an argument one way that says, well, you know, if a person can't find a job, they're going to stay in school. But then the other argument is that, well, if they can't find a job to earn money to pay for tuition, they're not going to go to school. But both results, I can't help but note, include not go to school. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, then you also have to look at, okay, well, what are the sectors in the economy which are kind of recession-proof or which are less likely to see pe young people laid off and what type of education do you need to put yourself into that type of job or that sector of the economy. I'm wondering if any of the data you've seen, Gerald, has found a recession-proof element of the, of the workforce, a recession-proof element of the economy. Um, a coding is a big one. Uh, financial services, to the extent that you know that they can interact with people without actually having to deal with them face to face or in person. So there are some jobs, some sectors that you know we see very little impact uh, um, of this pandemic, re pandemic-induced recession. Um, but I think sometimes it's hard to know how long-lasting those impacts will be. Right. Again, you know, people need insurance. 
they need to deal with an insurance broker when they buy a car and they need to get insur- insurance for their car. Uh, you know, are people going to start delaying purchases or doing things in a different way? Sometimes we don't see the trends until after the fact, right? Yeah, yeah. Gerald Beerling is a demographer, a statistician. He teaches uh, at the sociology department at at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. He's my right-hand man for the research that I do. Helps me understand the significance of the data that he brings to me. Gerald, thank you so much. Thank you, Cam. Good talking. We'll come back from the break with Michael Silver. He is the pivot king of the world, if you ask me. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regions. We'll be back. Listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Regions. Throughout the COVID crisis, we've heard business experts on this show talk to us about the need to pivot, to not give up, to not abandon ship, to not reverse course, but to pivot. The goals remain the same. The effort to get to the goals may need to change. The direction to get to the goals may need to change. And I've heard people talk about this so many times that I can put somebody on the air and predict about when it's go- when they're going to recommend this. Yesterday in a phone conversation, preparing for an upcoming Wednesday 6 p.m. show, I was on with Michael Silver. And Michael is the pivot king of the world. Michael has done it in such a way that when he told me about it as I was recording the show last night, that I said, I got to get you on, man. We got to talk about how you've learned to do this. Michael, thank you for your time. Welcome to the special edition of What's Working. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, 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 I want to reflect back to you, and we talked about this yesterday, what you said that made me really, uh, you know, tip my tip my cap to you, if you will. You assessed what it is, your value. What is it that you do for your customers? And the traditional method of what you've been doing has been taken away from you by the COVID crisis. Yet you continue to think of what it is that we do, and you found new ways to deliver entertainment to the audiences, one of which is the upcoming pop-up movie at the Hank Stadium, which I want to, to talk to you about. Another is, which I love, I just love, drive-in wrestling which i love that there uh, a, a wrestling match which you can drive into view i absolutely love it take us through this process if you will michael tell everybody what you told me which is what happened to your business you lost so much uh of on the books and then how you rebounded yes sir so uh quite the introduction thanks very much uh my main company is a company called paint university and what we do is we do dance parties on college campuses so the college books us and the check comes directly from the college now on march 12th uh we lost all of our gigs in april uh being a very seasonal business for the colleges we do most of our business in april and august and in april uh all the colleges shut down um so we had nothing we had nothing to do we lost close to two hundred thousand dollars in cancellations and uh luckily a lot of them did reschedule but that didn't as Cam, you said yesterday, that doesn't help cash flow uh, right now. Right. <laughs> um, so we had to look at it. We're, we're an entertainment company. How do we provide entertainment in this new world? How do, I, how do I keep my guys working? How do I keep myself with a purpose? And it, uh, it, it kind of came to me as I was sitting in Disney World at the Sci-Fi Dine-In Theater thinking, oh, this would be cool to have a drive-in. Um, so I reached out to a couple production companies that I had worked with, found someone with an inflatable screen. I learned everything I could about movie licensing and movie rights and begged uh, every person within an uh, hour and a half radius with a decent amount of land to let me try my new crazy drive-in pop-up movie experience. And I, uh, uh, after a couple cancellations, I finally landed it, the first one here in Pensacola uh, that we started about a month ago. Um, and we had to rethink everything. We had to rethink everything from the entertainment to how people get their concessions because we don't want people lining up and being outside walking around. We want, uh, so we developed a 
delivery food system to deliver food directly to the cars. And you were coding that system. I love this story. You were coding that system real time as people were parked in their cars, watching the movies, making orders. You were trying to figure out how to make that software work as you were taking those orders. Yes. Well, it wasn't me, but it was a member of my team. Uh, he w- he had his desktop there with the laptop sitting at uh, Pep's place in Pensacola under the awning, uh, watching orders come in, coding orders, adding things to make them work. Um, and and really just building it uh, on the spot. With no uh, with no alternative, with no plan B, you tend to be able to get yourself to a new destination, and that's certainly what's happened to you. And one of the things that I want to highlight that you told me yesterday is all these new business ideas that you've come up with, these pop-up theaters, these drive-in wrestling uh, events. There's more to them. There's more than those. You feel like are going to become a predictable, sustainable part of your business going forward in other words this isn't temporary this isn't a band-aid that you're going to take off at some point these efforts have led to new revenue streams for you yes sir yes they've led to essentially whole new angles and arms of business that i can use to uh fulfill my capacity because the business has a lot more available capacity than it's using as a seasonal business so if i can book either drive-in movie nights or Uh, movies in the park or other uh, things like that uh, to generate revenue and keep my guys working during those off times when we're not doing our dance parties for whatever reason. Uh, I think that I think it'll just help our business as a whole become larger. One of the things that this has led to, I want to draw you out on another piece of our conversation that I found fascinating, is a new movie screen that you're designing and developing in China right now. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes. So we uh, found it very, very hard to find the large inflatable screens that we need to put on the pop-up movie tour experience with our large, large screens, 30 foot and over. Um, So we bought the last 40 foot that was available in the country and and then uh, uh, sought help elsewhere through a friend of mine who runs the largest bounce house in the world. Uh, We're using their factory and facility to manufacture a new type screen that has a couple cool features that uh, none others have uh, I've seen before. Can you share those features? Sure. So our screen, uh, I call it Highlight Your Stakeholders with the Drive-In Dudes custom screen. We've got a tunnel going through the middle of it, so somebody could, A, walk out, introduce the movie, uh, and then walk back in seamlessly, or you could have some scare actors run out. Uh, You could have Doc Doc. Brown and Marty McFly walk out and wave to the crowd as they uh, go back to the future. Um, so they just, uh, it, it's what we're trying to do is make it more of an immersive experience rather than just a drive in, watch a movie. Yeah, I love it. I love the idea of a horror movie with characters yeah. uh, dressed appropriately, bus- bursting forth through the bottom of that screen and running out through the cars in their, you know, their macabre gear, whatever it may be. You've taken the experience you're working on, taking the experience to the next level. Now, tell us about the uh, the Hank, what you've got going on at Hank Aaron Stadium, and uh, is it the first time this will be done in Mobile, or have you done this already here in town? So this will be our third or fourth week over there. Um, this will actually be our last weekend in Mobile. Uh, we've got showing starting on Thursday and ending on Sunday. Uh, so we've got uh, two showings pretty much every night, uh, a one at sundown and a later showing that's usually more geared toward adult, uh, more adult films. And it's been a really great opportunity to work with the Mobile Sports and Entertainment Group, uh, who's been great partners over there. They're the ones who have taken over the Hank. And uh, it's been great to work with them and then my partners over at the Soul Kitchen. Uh, it's just been a real nice opportunity to get everybody working again. So if people are interested in learning which movies they are or buying tickets, tell them how the ticketing works, tell them the ticketing prices, et cetera. It's one price per car, it's not per head. Sure. So we like to call it our contactless, no-touch uh, ticketing system. You buy your ticket online. When you arrive on site, you hold up your phone with the QR code to your window, and our people scan it right through your window, Then they direct you to your spot, and you're set for a completely socially distant, no-touch experience. And how the audio works? The audio has gone through your FM radio in your car, um, 
which is pretty cool. Uh, that way you can kind of sit in your car with your windows up. Uh, and like you said, the tickets are uh, one per car. It's about $25 per car to get in. And it's been, it's been really great. I'm going to be sad to leave Mobile, but we will definitely be back uh, later on. I'm glad to see your efforts and your energy are showing up. Tell me with the other cities where these, uh, these pop-up theaters have happened and what the response has been. Sure. So we've been in Pensacola for about a month and a half now. Our first weekend event, events completely sold out, uh, and it's been pretty steady ever since. Uh, we're probably about to move locations to a couple spots in South Florida, maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit further east and west. Uh, but we're just looking to kind of branch out and start doing two different tours with two different systems. Uh, so we'll do a weekend here, a weekend there, and hopefully uh, be successful with it everywhere we go. Now, one of the things that you mentioned to me was your dance parties. They have to be socially distanced. And you've, <laughs> you've drawn these cubes on the ground where people can go do the disco dance, but they can't leave the box on the ground. Can you tell us about that? I love the image of this. I don't know if it, if it actually looks the way I see it in my head, but I love the image of this. Yeah, so some, uh, uh, some sister companies of mine, Headphone Disco and Roller Rave, have came up with an idea for how they can do dance floors with grids and essentially assign people grid numbers and they stay within that space and they're six feet apart from everybody and they're able to have a good time. I haven't seen how it all works yet. Uh, I saw the, the write up and it looked pretty dang cool, um, but it's just everyone trying to mold what they currently do to fit this new world uh, in the college space, especially um, where colleges are, are very sensitive and a lot of them are going to virtual schooling. Yeah, yeah. I, I, a lot of talk about whether the colleges will go back to campuses or not, but you mm -hmm. probably have a pulse on that as much as anyone else. What is your? What are you guys seeing? So I'm seeing that there is uh, not a uniformity. Um, we've uh, actually tracking every school that we can watch and see what their plans are. We're seeing that a lot of them are going to a hybrid and a lot of them going to a virtual, but I just fear that that campus life budget, that student life budget, that went to book my dance parties that are inherently not socially distant. Uh, I just don't know if they're gonna get the approval to spend money on that. So we're looking for the dance parties to go virtual. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm figuring out how I can do a, a glow paint dance party in a box or a foam party in a box with a virtual DJ. Um, we're coming up with all different kinds of ideas for everything from virtual worlds to um, you know, drive in, watch a, a live DJ uh, play. And I want to uh, reemphasize that this all these new product ideas, these new services that you're offering these clients, were born out of your realization that what you had been doing historically has suddenly been taken away from you due to the COVID economy, due to the COVID crisis. And rather than roll up in a ball and lick your wounds, you said, we are a company that entertains and we can find unique and new ways to do this. We have talent, we have uh, ideas, and we can execute on those ideas. Is that about it? That's about it. Yeah, I mean, I did spend about a week and a half uh, licking my wounds and wondering what I was going to do. But finally, I woke up and I was like, got to put shoes on today. Got to uh, got to refine your purpose. Yeah, I appreciate it, Michael. You don't, know, you don't know how inspirational you were to me yesterday after our call. And uh, as I continue to rethink what it is that I offer my clients. And it was really, really helpful. Folks, his show will probably air next Wednesday. Not tomorrow, but next Wednesday. That's Michael Silver pop-up drive-ins check them out at the hank this weekend michael thank you so much for your time you're listening to what's working we'll be back what's working is brought to you by regions i'm a big fan of michael silver if you can't tell and as you know from the history of the show 152 p.m we're a little bit short but 152 p.m is the show uh, recap where i highlight the best ideas the most important information that we've received during this time and number one comes from Gerald Beerling. Gerald, watch the unemployment numbers. They'll tell us the most about what to expect. Now, what he said, but was not a part of the data that he shared, is that youth are in disproportionately impacted in their future. 
We know they're being disproportionately impacted today due to the COVID economy, but this can last with them going forward. As a father of four children, this concerns me, and it's no fault of their own. It's no fault of anyone's, but what can we do to help these kids out? So that's the second one. First, or first, watch unemployment. Second, youth are disproportionately impacted. And third, be kind to a young folk as they're trying to get into the workplace right now, knowing that they could be hit long term. Now, we move into the best ideas from Michael Silver, and it's simply one word, pivot. The ability to pivot, the ability to rethink who you are and what you do and what you provide your customers. As for me, I've just pushing on the same door over and over again, and there are likely other doors around me that I should just walk through. The opportunity is there. It's a new way to think it. Now, as we go into the final segment of the day, I want to introduce you to my friend Carly Waters. Carly is a certified integrative health and wellness coach, a yoga instructor. She received her nutrition training from the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, the largest nutrition school in the world. Carly, let me start with this. Why do chips taste so good when I'm stressed? And why do I not, why do I keep eating them? <laughs> That's a very good question, especially uh, the way things have been lately the last couple of months. Um, when we are stressed, our senses are on high alert and like our taste buds, but when we're stressed, we're in that fight or flight response. It triggers your adrenal glands that re release your cortisols in your bloodstream. Well, cortisol increases your appetite for a need for energy because it thinks you're about to fight. So you need a quick burst of energy. Things like chips, cookies, some certain types of junk food give us that really quick energy because it's full of calories, full of sugar, and full of fat. And it may not be the best thing to do, but it, it, it satisfies that, that tension, that stress, that need for comfort. A lot of times when we're stressed out. So it's, it's not, there's a physiological reason for me of wanting to reach into the cupboard and grab something to eat when I'm, uh, when I'm dealing with the issues of the day then. But is there, it can't be, it, it can't be a good solution to gorge on chips. That's never a good solution for anything. What do you advise for my listeners and me who are saying there's still a lot of uncertainty? We may not talk about COVID as much as we did two, three weeks ago, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. And uh, the COVID-19 has turned out to be the COVID-22 to 25 for me. What do I do instead of reaching <laughs> for the chips? So my first um, piece of advice is I tell people just to use the word stop. So literally stop what you're doing, take a deep breath, observe your feelings, like what's going on? Why are you stressed? Why are you reaching for the potato chips in the cabinet? And then basically proceed with caution. So that's my little acronym for stop. Stop so what you're doing, take a deep breath, observe your feelings, and then proceed with caution. Think about what it's gonna make you feel like in an hour you know, your blood sugar is probably going to drop and you're going to be hungry again. You're going to be tired and cranky. Is it really worth it to dig into that chip bag or maybe instead go have an apple with some peanut butter? Yeah, these all sound like logical and very thoughtful <laughs> ways to proceed during this time, none of which apply to me very well. Now, are you seeing, Carly, in the last, since mid-March, when this became, this new world became a reality for all of us, uh, a, a shift, a swing in people's appetites, their behaviors, their desires to exercise. I talked to a guy this morning who said his gym has exploded with new members. Tell me what you're seeing. Yeah, for a while, I felt like with just all the uncertainty, a lot of people kind of stopped doing some of the things. They weren't exercising as much until the weather got nice and got to get outside. But the whole food thing was throwing everybody off. But now that we're starting to get back into somewhat of a routine, I know my studio's been open for a couple of weeks now, and everybody has been so excited and showing up. The classes are full. You know, you have to register online to reserve a spot, or you don't get in because we're following the social guidelines. But I feel like now people are ready just to get out of the house, exercise. They've been eating junk food, you know, trying to comfort themselves through all this and uh 
definitely. I'm seeing the shift. Yeah, you're seeing the shift. Are you seeing um, people? It reminds me a little bit of about January the 3rd what I call tourist season at the gym. Everybody comes yeah. off the Christmas break. We've been eating and drinking to our limits. And on January 3rd, we renew the same New Year's resolution that we did last year, which is this year I'm going to lose weight. And they hit that gym hard January the 3rd. They go maybe through the 10th, and then they drop their gym membership after that. The guy that I talked to this morning says, this time it's different. What do you see? Uh, you know, I just think it depends on the individual. You have some that are just that's the way they are but you have some that are more driven and who are going to stick to their plan and you know summertime also can be hard with people not in their particular routines so I think it's just going to depend on the individual and their motivation to you know feel good and look good in that bathing suit I guess yeah it's bathing suit (laughs) season that's that's uh yeah there's some of us that are just resigned to be a middle-aged middle-aged overweight thinning haired white guy and there ain't nothing that a bathing suit or a workout's going to do for me folks carly has been a great help to lisa and me she actually came to our house she looked at the cupboards she gave us some instruction and then she took us of a tour of a grocery store and taught us how to shop she's good stuff carly tell people where they can find you um you can find me at alum health dash wellness.com I'm also on Facebook, Carly Thompson Waters. I also have a Facebook page, Loom by Carly. Folks, you're listening to What's Working. We've got another show planning on two, on Thursday of this week, military historian talking to us about what different people might have done differently in the COVID economy or the COVID crisis based on their military uh, background and some advice for us going forward using some of these great military leaders. It's an odd but wonderful way to combine expertise with a current crisis, and we'll have that for you Thursday. Carly, thank you for your time. You're listening to What's Working, brought to you by Regions. I'll talk to you again Thursday. Tomorrow night, Pat O'Brien, 6 p.m.